When this episode drops, there is one week left in hashtag Moxie Million. We're trying to get your brain on facts to 1 million downloads by its fourth birthday on February 27th. And as of the Saturday afternoon before this episode drops, we're at 978,020. So please share the show. Tell your friends, I know you've got your phone on you. Open up your podcast app and listen to Your Brain on Facts. And be sure to share on social media with the hashtag Moxie Million. Because whether we make it to a million or not, every week, someone who used that hashtag is going to win exclusive swag. Hitting the million download mark would be an amazing birthday milestone for the show. Hashtag Moxie Million. Welcome to part four of Earth's Unsungest Heroes, Black Inventors. Last week, we talked about male black inventors who couldn't get patents because they had been enslaved at the time of their invention. And today, it's the women's turn. I don't have bookends for this. Let's get right into it. My name's Moxie, and this is your Brain on Facts. Researching African-American history is a lot harder than it should be. This isn't a new revelation, obviously, but I think it bears repeating for as long as the condition exists. The stories of the marginalized don't get copied down. And then there was the whole lost cause thing, actively eradicating what stories had been recorded. For those in the far-flung parts, fortunate enough not to have attended a school whose history books were written or chosen by these assholes. The lost cause was people like the Daughters of the Confederacy purposefully, deliberately rewriting history. Their version of events was that Civil War generals were heroes, slaves were generally treated well and were happy to work for their masters, and that the war was about states' rights, not the basic immorality of owning another human being. It was from this movement that my hometown of Richmond, Virginia, got a beautiful tree-lined avenue of expensive row houses, and every third block had a statue of a Civil War general. The number of Confederate memorials peaked around 1910, 50 years after the end of the Civil War, and in the height of Jim Crow, an era of codified segregation and disenfranchisement laws against Black Americans. Installations spiked again in the 50s and 60s during the Civil Rights Movement. It was nothing to do with celebrating ancestors who fought for what they believed in, which you shouldn't do if your ancestor was so brilliantly wrong in their beliefs. It was about telling African Americans that you haven't forgotten that they used to be under your boot, and you'd bring it all back tomorrow if you could. The statues are top of mind for me today because I was just in a social networking event with Noah Scalin and Mark Cheatham, the artists who created a now iconic, regionally speaking, image of the empty plinth where the Robert E. Lee statue stood. Scalin was the guy who started the website Skull A Day, if you ever saw that, and my husband helped him do an art installation in Times Square. But my squirrel brain was talking about the inherent difficulty of researching this topic. Details were sparse enough for the male inventors, and it wasn't uncommon for me to find the same photo used on articles of different people. And if I were to ever, say, share an image of Benjamin Montgomery with the caption Henry Boyd, many, many apologies. But in researching black women inventors, I'd be lucky to find a picture, misattributed or otherwise. Or their story wasn't enough of a bio to fill out a 3x5 index card. I got basically nothing. Bupkis. El Zilcho. Well, not nothing nothing, but not a fraction of what I wanted to present to you. One of my goals with Your Brain on Facts has always been to amplify the stories of people of color, women, and the LGBT. See my recent TikTok at Moxie Labouche about the amazing Gladys Bentley for the trifecta. But I guess if I really mean to do that, I'm going to have to abandon Google in favor of an actual library. I love a library. I used to spend summer afternoons at the one by my house in high school. It was cool, quiet, full of amazing knowledge and new stories. And best of all, my four little sisters had no interest in going with me. When you come from a herd of six, anything that you can have exclusively to yourself, even if it's because no one else wants it, immediately becomes your favorite thing. 
So I don't have as much as I wanted about black female inventors of the pre-Civil War era, but I did find one real gem that I almost gave the whole episode over to, but we'll come to her in her own time. As with the male inventors, it can be a little sketch to say this one was first or that one was first, and there are a number of reasons for this. Black people kept in bondage were expressly prohibited from being issued patents. Some would change their name or use initials in an attempt to hide their race. Some would use white proxies. And of course, many enslaved inventors had their ideas stolen, usually by their enslaver, who believed that they owned not only the person, but all of their work output. Not only the sweat from their brow, but the thoughts in their head. The other big thing that makes early patent history tricky is something I've dealt with myself personally, twice, a good old structure fire. A fire broke out in the temporary patent office, and even though there was a fire station right next door, 10,000 early patents were lost, as were about 7,000 patent models, which used to be part of the application process. So long story short, we don't, and probably can't, know definitively who was the first, second, and third black woman to receive a patent. So I'm going to take what names I could find and put them in chronological order by patent date, though surely there will be inventors whose names have been lost, possibly forever. Martha Jones is often referred to as the first black woman to receive a U.S. patent in 1868, three years after the end of the Civil War, for her improvement to the corn husker sheller. Her invention made it possible to husk, shell, cut, and separate corn all in one step, saving a lot of time and labor. Now this would be for dry or field corn, the kind used to make cornbread or feed to animals, not sweet corn, the kind you eat on the bone in the summertime. This invention laid a foundation stone for advancements in automatic agricultural processes still in use today. I can show you the schematics for Jones's patent, but as for Jones herself, I've got sweet Fanny Adams. I can tell you Jones got her patent 59 years after the first white woman got hers for a weaving process for making bonnets, which I think also illustrates what constituted a problem in each woman's life. On the gender side of things, Jones's patent came 47 years before Thomas Jennings became the first black man to receive a patent in 1821 for the precursor to dry cleaning, whose details were lost in that fire. Next up, or so it is believed, was another Jones. It's like whales in here today. Mary Jones de Leon. In 1873, de Leon was granted patent number 140,253 for an invention titled Cooking Apparatus. De Leon, who we know lived in Baltimore, Maryland and is buried outside Atlanta, Georgia, created an apparatus for heating or cooking food either by dry heat or steam or both. It was an early precursor to the steam tables now used in buffets and cafeterias all over. Remember buffets? We'll be explaining them to our grandkids. You'd go to a restaurant and eat out of communal troughs with strangers for like five bucks. By the way, if I were to refer to this as a chafing dish and you thought of a throwaway line from the 1991 movie Hot Shots, no, a crock pot is for cooking all day. That's why we're friends. If you didn't, don't worry, we're still friends. The third patent in our particular pattern went to Judy Woodford Reed, and that patent is one of the only records we have for her. She improved existing bakery machinery with her dough kneader and roller in 1884. Her design mixed the dough more evenly while keeping it covered, which would basically constitute sterile conditions back then. Reed is listed in the 1870 federal census as a 44-year-old seamstress outside of Charlottesville, Virginia, along with her husband, Alan, a gardener, and their five children. Sometime between 1880 and 1885, her husband, Alan, died, and Judy began calling herself Widow of Alan and moved to Washington, D.C. It's unlikely she was able to read, write, or even sign her name. The census refers to Judy and Alan both as illiterate, and her patent is signed with an X. That actually might have worked to her favor. 
Lots of whites, about one in five, were illiterate back then too, and an X would not reveal softer, more feminine handwriting. Bonus fact, illiteracy is why we use an X as a kiss at the bottom of a letter or greeting card. People who couldn't sign their name to a contract or legal document would mark it with an X and kiss the X to seal their oath. Tracing the origin of using an O to mean a hug is entirely unclear, though, and theories abound. The first African-American woman to fully sign a patent was Sarah Good of Chicago. Good obtained a patent in 1885 for a cabinet bed, a sectional bedstead adapted to be folded together when not in use so as to occupy less space and made generally to resemble some article of furniture when so folded. Details continue to be sparse, but we know that as of age 5 in 1860, she was free and living in Ohio. She moved to Chicago 10 years later, and 10 years after that, married a man named Archibald, who was a carpenter, as her father had been. They had some kids, as people often do, though we don't know how many. If they had many kids or lived in a small space for the number of kids that they had, that could have been what motivated Good to create a very early version of those cool transformative desk bed things that you see online for hundreds or thousands of dollars. Good's invention had hinged sections that were raised or lowered. When not functioning as a bed, the invention could be used as a desk with small compartments for storage, ideal for a small city apartment, especially if there were like hella kids in there. We have a bit more on another Sarah inventor, this time Sarah Boone of North Carolina. Born into bondage in 1832, Boone may have acquired her freedom by marrying James Boone, a free black man, in 1847. Together, they had eight children and worked to help the Underground Railroad. Soon the family, along with Sarah's widowed mother, made their way north to New Haven, Connecticut. Sarah worked as a dressmaker and James as a bricklayer until his death in the 1870s. They had done well enough for themselves to purchase their own home. Far removed from the strictures and structures of enslavement, Sarah became a valued member of her community and began taking reading and writing lessons. It was through her workaday life as a dressmaker that she invented a product you probably have in your home today, the modern ironing board. Quick personal aside in an episode that's already been chock full of them, did anyone else marry military or former military and make your spouse do all the ironing because you assume they're better at it from having to do their uniform? I can't be the only one who's like that. Back to Sarah Boone though, who wanted to produce a cheap, simple, convenient, and highly effective device particularly adapted to be used in ironing the sleeves and bodies of ladies' garments. You might think the ironing board didn't need to be invented, that it was just one of those things everybody kind of just had. But no, prior to Boone, you'd put bits of wood between the backs of two chairs, like a makeshift sawhorse. And anyone who's ever used a makeshift sawhorse only to have it slide apart from under you or end up sawing into your dining room table will attest that there was indeed room for improvement. She began by creating a narrower, curved board that could slip into the sleeves of dresses and shirts, with padding to stop the texture of the wooden base from being stamped into the fabric by the iron, and the whole thing folded up for easy storage. With a bit of help from other dressmakers, she finalized the design for which she was awarded her patent in 1892. Such a simple device was a boon to many a homemaker, no pun intended, though there remains the extent to which she actually profited from her invention. She may have had the patent, but remember, a patent can't actually stop someone from ripping you off. And many manufacturers did, creating this indispensable and ubiquitous household item. And now a word from our sponsors. If you enjoy the incredible real stories that you hear on Your Brain on Facts, you're going to want to check out the podcast, What Was That Like? It's different from any other show that you'll listen to. Each episode is a conversation between the host, Scott Johnson, and a regular run-of-the-mill person who's been through a not-run-of-the-mill experience. 
Like being involved in a mass shooting, surviving a plane crash, getting bitten by a rattlesnake, or getting a deal on Shark Tank? The guest tells the story, not the host. So you hear firsthand what happened. And it does exactly what it says on the tin, with episode titles like Ramon's wife hired a hitman to kill him, and David won big on Wheel of Fortune. You can find What Was That Like on your favorite podcast app or at whatwasthatlike.com. Have you ever wanted to learn about the worst year in human history? What about learning the secrets behind professional wrestling? Or maybe the dark conspiracies of Denver's airport? Well, if so, check out Reddit on Wiki, a podcast where three self-described dummies try their best to explain new topics using Reddit and Wikipedia as their main source of research. Join John, Josh, and Sean every Monday to learn something new and have some laughs along the way. So open up the podcast player you're using right now and search for Reddit on Wiki. And that's Reddit like r slash. Or go to redditonwiki.com. You made it through the holidays, but now we have to slog through the winter when it can be really hard to take care of yourself. Fresh fruits and vegetables tend to leave our diets, and we're just not getting the vitamins and antioxidants we need. Luckily, there's Sambucol. Sambucol is the original black elderberry supplement. Now, I'm kind of a big fan of elderberries. We have an elderberry tree that we planted just outside our front door. Black elderberries are a natural source of vitamins C, E, and A and have more free radical fighting antioxidants than cranberries, blueberries, or pomegranates. But my favorite part about it is all the different ways you can take it. They have gummies, which are super tasty and nice and tart, a syrup, which goes lovely in a cup of chamomile tea. And if you go to sambucallusa.com and use the code BRAIN15, you get 15% off your next order of $9.99. sambucallusa.com, offer code BRAIN15. Lita Newman is remembered for two things. She patented the first hairbrush with synthetic bristles in 1898, and her activism for women's suffrage in the early 20th century. She was a key organizer of a black branch of the Women's Suffrage Party, which was trying to give women the legal right to vote. We know she was born in Ohio sometime between 1865 and 1885, which is a hell of a range for history so relatively recent, and that she spent most of her life living in New York City working as a hairdresser. As a hairdresser and the owner of a head of hair herself, Newman wanted the process of brushing hair to be more efficient and more hygienic. Most hairbrushes were made using animal hair, the same kind you might use for shaving brushes or paint brushes. Now imagine trying to get knots out with a shaving brush. Animal-based bristles were too soft for the job, which is where we get the old trope slash advice of brushing your hair with a hundred strokes every night. It took that many to get the job done. And that was for white women. Most brushes were basically useless for the thicker textures of African-American hair. Animal hair also harbored bacteria like it's nobody's business, which is especially unfortunate since it was also used to bristle toothbrushes. And oh yeah, back in the day, you'd have a single household toothbrush that everyone shared. Newman's hairbrush used synthetic fibers, which were more durable and easier to clean, in evenly spaced rows of bristles with open slots to clear away bits of debris and hair into a recessed compartment. The back opened with a button to clean it out. And this wasn't a gimmick or a fly-by-night idea. Newman's invention changed the hair care industry by making hairbrushes less expensive and easier to manufacture. This paved the way for other black inventors in the hair care space to actually create the black hair care industry, chief among them, Sarah Breedlove. Don't recognize her name? What if I call her Madam C.J. Walker? Breedlove, born in 1867 in Louisiana, was the first child in her family born into freedom. But she found herself an orphan at the age of seven after both parents died of yellow fever. 
She lived with a brother-in-law who abused her before marrying Moses McWilliams at age 14. Sarah was a mother at 17 and a widow at 20. So, on the whole, not having a good time of it. Oh, and to top that all off, her hair was falling out. She developed a product to treat the scalp disease that caused the alopecia, made of petroleum jelly, sulfur, and a little bit of perfume to make it smell good. And it worked. She called it Madam C.J. Walker's Wonderful Hair Grower. She was now married to Charles Walker. And along with Madam C.J. Walker Vegetable Shampoo, began selling it door to door to other African-American women suffering the same condition. Five years later, she set up the Madam C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company and later expanded her business to Central America and the Caribbean. She recruited 25,000 black women by the early 1900s to act as door-to-door beauty consultants across North and Central America and the Caribbean. Walker was one of the first using the method known today as direct sales marketing to distribute her products, a method later adopted by companies like Avon, Tupperware, and others. Oh, and she paid well, too. You could earn $25 a week with Walker, a damn sight better than the $2 a week you'd make as a domestic servant. Her workforce grew to be 40,000 strong. So don't be telling me that paying a living wage is bad for business. Walker didn't keep her success to herself either, but used her wealth to support African-American institutions the Black YMCA, helped people with their mortgages, donated to orphanages and old folks' homes, and was a believer in the power of education. Now, be sure you don't do as I was wont to do and accidentally conflate her with Maggie Walker, the first African-American woman to charter a bank and the first African-American female bank president, and an advocate for the disabled as well, because she deserves coverage of her own. As I was searching for black female inventors, I came across one listicle with a paragraph on a woman the author claimed helped invent the city of Los Angeles. That's a bit of a stretch, I thought to myself. But as I read the story of Bridget Biddy Mason, I became so utterly fascinated, I almost flipped the script to do the episode entirely about her. I did not, as you have plainly noticed, since I'd already done primary research for the first six pages of what's usually a seven-page script. And she wasn't the only subject like that. Over at patreon.com slash yourbrainonfacts, new supporters like Marissa and our top supporters like David Emication Likely, Adam Baum, who just won week three of Moxie Million, Alyssa, Sindra, Dana, David, George, Jessica, Jesse, Karen, Michael K., Nathan, Paul, Rick, Sean, and Vadislav will get to hear the amazing life of Elizabeth Keckley, who went from being a slave to the most sought-after dressmaker in Washington, D.C., to mm, abject ignominy. But hers was another story I couldn't tear myself away from, so look for that bonus mini at patreon.com slash yourbrainonfacts. Biddy was born into slavery in 1818 in Georgia, maybe. We do know she spent much of her early life on a plantation owned by Robert Smithson. During her adolescence, she learned domestic and agricultural skills, as well as herbal medicine and midwifery, from African, Caribbean, and Native American traditions from other enslaved women. Her knowledge and skill made her beneficial to both the enslaved and the plantation owners. According to some researchers, Biddy was either given to or sold to Robert Smith and his wife Rebecca in Mississippi in the 1840s. Biddy had three children, Ellen, Anne, and Harriet. Their paternity is unknown, but it's speculated that Anne and Harriet were fathered by Smith or a member of his family. Smith, a Mormon convert, followed the call of church leaders to settle in the West to establish a new Mormon community in what would become Salt Lake City, Utah, in what was still at that time part of Mexico. The Mormon church was A-OK with slavery, encouraging people to treat the enslaved kindly as they were lesser beings in need of the white man's protection. In 1848, 30-year-old Mason walked 1,700 miles behind a 300-wagon caravan Along the route, 
Her responsibilities included setting up and breaking camp, cooking meals, herding livestock, acting as a nurse and midwife, as well as, you know, raising her three daughters, aged 10, 4, and an infant. Utah didn't last long for the Smiths, and three years later, they set out in a 150-wagon caravan for San Bernardino, California, to establish another Mormon community. Ignoring warnings that slavery was illegal in California, Smith gathered his livestock and the people he treated like livestock and schlepped them along. Although California joined the United States as a free state in 1850, the laws around forced labor were complicated, and there was a lot of forced labor about. For example, indigenous people could be forced to work as contract laborers. How, you ask? Well, this made me swear loudly when I read it. Every weekend, the local authorities would arrest intoxicated natives on dubious charges and take them to what was essentially a slave mart, auctioning off their labor for the coming week. If they were paid at the end of that week, they were usually paid in alcohol, so they would get drunk and be arrested to be auctioned off again. Along the way, Biddy Mason met free blacks who urged her to legally contest her slave status once she reached California. When they got to Cali, Mason met more free blacks, like her lifelong friends Robert and Minnie Owens, who told her the same thing. Smith must have noticed this, because just a few years later, fearing the loss of his slaves, he decided to move the whole kit and caboodle to Texas, a definite slave state. This was obviously real bad news for Mason and the others. But thankfully, Mason had the Owens on her side, particularly now that her 17-year-old daughter was in love with one of their sons and he with her. The law was on her side, too. The California Fugitive Slave Act, enacted in 1852, allowed slave owners to temporarily hold enslaved persons in California and transport them back to their home state. But that law wouldn't cover Smith since he wasn't from Texas originally. When Robert Owens told the sheriff that there were people being illegally held in bondage and about to be transported to a slave state, the sheriff gathered a posse, including Owens, his sons, and the cattlemen of Owens Ranch, and cut Smith off at the pass literally at Cajon Pass, preventing him from leaving the state. The sheriff was armed with a legal document, a writ of habeas corpus, signed by Judge Benjamin Hayes. Biddy Mason and her extended family, 13 women and children, were taken into protective custody, and she petitioned the court for her freedom. Their fate was now in the hands of that same Judge Hayes. You wouldn't expect Hayes to be on Mason's side in a dispute against Smith. Hayes hailed from a slave state and had owned slaves himself. Plus, in his time as a journalist, he'd written pro-Mormon articles. The trial started with a damning statement from Biddy's eldest daughter, Hannah, herself a mother of a newborn, saying she wanted to go to Texas. The sheriff spoke to her afterwards and found out she was terrified of Smith and had said what she was told to say. She wasn't wrong to be scared. Smith threatened Mason's lawyer and eventually successfully bribed him to leave the case. Smith's son and hired hands went to the jail where the family was being kept safe and tried to intimidate the jailer. They also threatened the Owens family and a neighborhood grocer and a doctor. They said, If this case isn't resolved on Southern principles, you'll all pay the price, all people of color. Judge Hayes he wasn't having any of this. Technically, Mason and her children had become free the minute they stepped into California. The new California Constitution stated that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, unless for the punishment of crimes, shall ever be tolerated in this state. However, lacking options and probably unaware of her full rights, Mason had continued to serve in Smith's household. Smith claimed that Mason and the others had stayed because they were, quote, members of his family, who voluntarily offered to go to Texas with him. Mason, as a non-white person, was legally barred from testifying against the white Smith in court. 
So Judge Hayes, sticking with the letter of the law, took her into his chambers along with two trustworthy local gentlemen to act as observers to her deposition. He asked her only whether she was going voluntarily, and she said, I always do what I have been told, but I have always been afraid of this trip to Texas. Smith fled to Texas before the trial had concluded. On January 19th, Judge Hayes ruled in favor of Mason. And it further appearing by satisfactory proof to the judge here that all the said persons of color are entitled to their freedom and are free and cannot be held in slavery or involuntary servitude. It is therefore argued that they are entitled to their freedom and are free forever. He hoped they would, quote, become settled and go to work for themselves in peace and without fear. Okay, now we're getting to the part of Biddy Mason's story that the listicle writer used to include her in the gallery of inventrixes. Mason and her family moved to Los Angeles, then a dusty little town of only 2,000 or so residents, less than 20 of whom were black, where she worked as a midwife and nurse. As the town grew, so did her business. Basically, if you were having a baby, Biddy Mason was delivering it. Well, her friend Dr. Griffin probably helped, but we're here to talk about Biddy. After tending to hundreds of illnesses and births, she was known about town as Aunt Biddy. As a midwife, Mason was able to cross class and color lines, and she viewed everyone as part of her extended family. In her big black medicine bag, she carried the tools of her trade and the papers from Judge Hayes affirming that she was free, just in case. By 1866, she had saved enough money to buy a property on Spring Street. Her daughter Ellen remembered that her mother firmly told the family, the first homestead must never be sold. She wanted her family to always have a home to call their own. My family is the same way. If you can own land, even if it's an empty lot, do. Mason's small wood-framed house at 311 Spring Street was not just the family home. It became a refuge for stranded and needy settlers, a daycare center for working women in the neighborhood, and a civic meeting place. In 1872, a group of Black Angelinos founded the first African Methodist Episcopal Church at her house, and they met there until they were able to get their own building. Mason continued to invest in real estate while also making sure to give back to the community. According to the Los Angeles Times, she was a frequent visitor to the jail, speaking a word of cheer and leaving some token and a prayerful hope with every prisoner. In the slums of the city, she was known as Grandma Mason and did much active service toward uplifting the worst element in Los Angeles. She paid taxes and all expenses on church property to hold it for her people. During the flood in the early 80s, she gave an open order to a little grocery store, which was located on 4th and Spring Streets. By the terms of this order, all families made homeless by the flood were to be supplied with groceries, while Biddy Mason cheerfully paid the bill. Eventually, she was able to buy 10 acres on which she built rental homes and eventually a large commercial building she rented out. And that land that she developed is now in the heart of downtown L.A., three substantial plots near what is now Grand Central Market, as well as land on San Pedro Street in Little Tokyo. Mason was a shrewd businesswoman, too. L.A. was booming, and rural Spring Street was soon becoming crowded with shops and boarding houses. In 1844, she sold the north half of her Spring Street property for the equivalent of over a quarter million dollars and had a mixed-use building built on the other half. That means businesses on the bottom and apartments above. She sold a lot that she purchased on Olive Street for the then money of $2,800, now about half a million. And that $2,800 netted her a tidy profit considering she had bought it for less than 400 in 1885, she deeded a portion of her remaining Spring Street property to her grandsons for the sum of love and affection and $10. She signed the deed with her customary flourished X. 
Although she was a successful real estate pioneer and nurse who stressed the importance of education and taught herself Spanish, she never learned to read or write. Bridget Biddy Mason died in 1891, one of the wealthiest women in Los Angeles. For reasons not recorded, she was buried in an unmarked grave in Evergreen Cemetery. While you'd be hard pressed to visit her grave, you can visit the small park created in her honor. Designed by landscape architects Catherine Spitz and Pamela Burton, it has an 80-foot-long poured concrete wall created by artist Sheila de Bretville, displays a timeline of Biddy's life, illustrated with images like wagon wheels and a midwife's bag, as well as pictures of early survey maps of Los Angeles and Biddy's freedom papers. From the northmost end of the wall with the text, Biddy Mason, born a slave, all the way down to Los Angeles mourns and reveres Grandma Mason. If you're ever down near the Bradbury Building on Spring Street, get some pictures for me. And that's where we run out of ideas, at least for today. Don't be surprised at all if you see this topic come up again next February, because I haven't even started in on inventors of like the mid-century or the modern era, all the fabulous names that have been inducted into the National Inventor Hall of Fame, barely scratching the surface of this topic. And hey, who doesn't like learning about inventors? Remember, you can always find the source links and the script for the show at yourbrainonfacts.com. Thanks for spending part of your day with me, and stay safe.